Welcome to this eLearn security video lesson on socket reuse. This is a three-part video series, and in this first video, we are going to cover using the socket reuse shellcode in memory corruption exploits. Socket reuse shellcode is also used when there are limited connectivity options for the attacker, like with a strict firewall. Socket reuse shellcode is another type of shellcode that might come in handy when there is limited space available for the allocation of shellcode. Socket reuse can be used as an alternative to the egg hunter shellcode. Let's go ahead and check out the socket reuse shellcode to see what it is and how it can be used in exploits. This video is based on a resource available on the web. Vuln Server is a known application that was purposely created vulnerable. Similarly to web exploitation training software like DVWA or WebGoat, Vuln Server is used to test your binary exploitation skills against it. Vuln Server can be downloaded from GitHub in a pre-compiled version. For this video, we already downloaded the application, which can be seen in the following directory. Here we have some README files, the source code files, one DLL library, and the Vuln server executable itself. Let's start with a little help by studying the following diagram in this article. Later on, we will continue exploitation without using it. Basically, what we are interested in is determining what the socket exactly is. Behind every open port, there is a socket, regardless if it is a Windows or Unix system. A socket is needed to establish a connection between the client and the server. The server is the communication side that listens for a connection, and the client is the one who initiates a dialog by connecting to the server. Depending on which side the socket belongs to, the client or the server, the socket goes through different possible states during subsequent phases of the connection. The client socket first establishes the connection and then the TCP three-way handshake takes place. Next, during the connection, the sockets perform write and read operations between each other. Write to the socket means that it sends data away to the internet. You can treat a socket as a portal to the outer network. If you read from the socket, you are receiving data that came from a remote machine to the socket. As the client doesn't want to continue the connection anymore, it can disconnect by closing the socket. There is a lot more to be done on the server side. First, as the port is opened, bind associates a socket with an address and listen puts it in listening state. The accept function comes next as the incoming connection is accepted. Now the sides can start talking with each other and, similarly to the client, the server also performs write and read operation on its side. At the end of the dialog, the server was notified about the client being disconnected. Therefore, it can close the socket as well. Let's get back to attacking the application. We will use Vuln Server, and we will also use x32 debug as its currently most known Windows GUI debugger, which has active support and an x64 version available for use with 64-bit applications. As you will see, it is not very different from Ali or Immunity Debugger. Let's take a look at the network configuration of both the victim and attacker machines. We can see the IP config output. And we can also see the IP, which ends in 129. Let's now go to the attacking machine.
let's confirm visibility on the network level by issuing a ping to the victim. As we can see, the victim was confirmed using ping. We can now start to attack it. We will not perform vulnerability discovery in this video. Rather, we will use a ready proof of concept that causes the software to crash in a desired manner so we can control the EIP. So the EIP control will be our starting point. The proof of concept is written in Python and is very simple. First, the target IP and port are specified. Then, a kstat command is issued, followed by an argument to it. The argument consists of a long buffer of letters, which causes the target software to crash due to a buffer overflow. Four B letters are in place that are supposed to directly overwrite the EIP register. The last part of the buffer, the Cs, are meant to serve as a placeholder for future shellcode. In a perfect scenario, we will be able to fill the buffer with A's, overwrite the EIP at the place where the B's currently reside, possibly overwriting it with a jump or another instruction that redirects the execution flow onto the stack, and then start to execute shellcode that will be stored in a place of the current C's. Let's see if this scenario is possible by launching the exploit against the Voln server instance. In the Windows 7 machine, we will start the Voln server using the x32 debugger. The debugger will not be presented separately, but during the exploit development, you will see various features of it in action. We will now use the open functionality to start a new executable in the same way as in any other debugger. The debugger automatically pauses the execution upon being attached to the target software. We can now press run and we see that there is another breakpoint that was automatically set up by the debugger in the entry point of the debugged software. This is a very useful feature when you are interested in debugging the software from the very beginning. In a later part of this video series, we will make use of the entry breakpoint. So far, we just need to run the executable and make sure that it is running. Let's now fire the exploit against the Voln server. We also need to run the software since it was in a paused state. Immediately, we see that the exception happens. If we take a look at the registers window, we can see that the EIP value is 42, 42, 42, 42, which is the equivalent of 4 Bs. If we look at the stack view, we can see the payload being stored there due to overflow. Also, the C buffer was truncated, and there are only a few Cs on the stack. Let's right-click on the data that is currently on top of the stack, and select Follow in Dump so that we can inspect it. We will be able to see how the stack view, the ESP value, and the dump view are related to each other. Data from the stack is visible in dump, and the address of the top of the stack is held in ESP in the registers window. You can choose any way you like to view the data you are interested in. For example, the dump view also has the ASCII dump functionality, which might be convenient while viewing ASCII representation of bytes. Here we see that we sent 500 Cs while the buffer contains approximately 20. Some garbage was generated by the software and is placed in the memory. Thus, there is no possibility to store a shellcode within the C buffer.
Usually, in such a case, we should go for an egg hunter shellcode scenario. Since we still have about 20 bytes after the EIP, it is likely that we can restore the execution to the stack and then move it back to the initial 70 bytes in order to execute some kind of egg hunter shellcode. Egg hunter shellcode requires another connection in order to perform a payload delivery. We would need to find a way to interact with the software in a way that stores data that is sent to it, at least for some time, so it can be located by the egg hunter. However, there is an alternative. We will utilize the socket reuse shellcode in order to write a fully functional exploit. Now we will explain some base assumptions of the socket reuse idea. How can the existing socket be abused in order to turn this limited buffer overflow into a reliable remote code execution exploit? Since you already know what socket is, try to think about the read operation and how it receives data. The main idea behind the exploit is that if we are able to force the socket to receive the data again into an area that we control, we might be able to perform a second overflow and this time get a non-truncated C buffer while continuing execution to it instantly after receiving and storing the C buffer into Vuln server memory. Turning our attention to the disassembly view, we can see the receive function, which is RECV when typed out. If we can force it to receive the data once more, we can possibly omit the buffer truncating functionality, whatever it is, and write a full unmodified buffer onto the stack during runtime. So reusing the socket means re-receiving data from the client, and this is essentially what we will try to accomplish during this video. In order to do this, we will start with moving the execution to the largest space available we control, so at the beginning of the A buffer. We need to start developing the exploit the usual way, by finding a reference to our payload and jumping to it. If we take a look at the registers, you can see that ESP holds the pointer to the C buffer, which is the beginning of our payload on the top of the stack. Let's right click on the ESP value and choose follow in dump. You can conveniently see the C's being pointed to ESP. We need to find an instruction that will move execution to where ESP points to, for example, jump ESP or call ESP. Let's go to the memory map tab and take a look at all the modules being loaded by the software. As you can see, there are lots of system modules. Since we are on Windows 7, we can expect all of them to be ASLR and DEP compatible, which means that we cannot use it in the exploit. We also see the DLL that was shipped together with the Vuln server. As it is a custom executable, we can expect it to have non-standard exploit mitigation configurations, or that it may not utilize them at all. If you ever develop an exploit against a custom software, you should carefully examine the software shipped libraries too, as they are often the weak link in the exploitation chain, and as it does not utilize exploit protections, even if system DLLs do. Let's take a look at the sfunc.dll library. We will examine it using x32 debug functionality. Let's right click it and copy its address. We will then switch to the log tab. 
we can see the output of various activities being saved here. It is similar to Immunity Debugger's view, so it should not be confusing. Let's issue the image info command along with the base address of the sfunc.dll that we just copied and press enter. The results are shown immediately. What is most interesting here is the DLL characteristics flag. If it is zero, that means that no exploit protections are supported by this DLL. Thus, we are free to hard code any address of it in our exploit since it is not subject to the ASLR, which is enabled in Windows 7, and it will not decrease the final exploit reliability. Let's navigate back to the memory map in order to examine the sfunc.dll further. In the protection column, we can see the current protection level for each section of a module. We are only interested in E, which stands for executable, since we want to execute a jump-like instruction from this area. The choice is obvious as there is only one section with a suitable permission level. Let's double click on the section name. We are being moved to the CPU tab where disassembly of the module can be found. Also, the title of our window has changed, so we know what module we are currently working on. Let's use the keyboard shortcut Control F to find a suitable instruction. Upon pressing those keys, a window appears, and we can type in jump ESP and click the OK button or press Enter. Several instructions were found. Since there are no null bytes in any of the instruction, we can take any of them. Let's go ahead and take the first one. Now, right click on the first instruction as we are about to utilize it, and then choose Copy and Address as it will be needed for the exploit code. Let's also click the first instruction so it's highlighted and place a breakpoint on it by pressing F2. The instruction should change its highlight color to red. In the bottom bar, we can see a message that a breakpoint was set. We set the breakpoint in order to be able to debug the shellcode more easily. Upon encountering this jump, the debugger will stop, and this will allow us to navigate through all subsequent instructions one by one instead of being immediately transferred into an area of ESP. Let's switch to exploit development and add the jump ESP instruction address to the exploit. We will add it to the place where it overwrites the EIP. And let's not forget about the endianness, as we will need to write the address in reverse order. We now need to restart the software. All the breakpoints set will remain saved. Let's skip through the first two default breakpoints so the software is now in running state, and then run the exploit. As you can see, the breakpoint at the selected jump instruction was hit. Also, the rest of our buffer is visible on the stack. Let's use the step in utility once to execute exactly one instruction. We land in the C buffer after the jump ESP operation. Here is the address of the instruction, and now we are executing the Cs. Whatever code is in this place can be executed.
Our next task will be to use this C buffer in order to jump backwards to the A buffer. The buffer actually starts a bit earlier. As we are viewing disassembly dump, the debugger interprets all data it encounters as instructions, although what is really there is the beginning of the kstet command. At the address that ends with 995, there is byte 20, and our buffer starts right after it. Thus, whenever we would like to reference our buffer, we should remember it starts at 996. X32 Debug offers functionality that can help us perform a backward jump without doing the arithmetic. Instead, the debugger can do it for us. Let's go back to the beginning of the A buffer and copy its address, keeping in mind that it's one byte bigger than what we actually copied. Now, let's go to the C buffer and click on the first instruction in it so it is highlighted. Then, let's either press the spacebar or double click the instruction. The assemble window should appear. Using this view, we can dynamically rewrite instructions within an executable. Let's change the existing instruction to jump and paste the copied address of A buffer. We also need to increase the last byte by 1 since we want to omit byte 20. The instruction encoded successfully, which means that what we entered within the window is a valid instruction and a debugger knows how to translate it into opcodes. In case we write some garbage there, the assemble window displays an error message, as the debugger was not able to understand what we typed in. We can now press OK and observe that the debugger already optimized the instruction size and converted it to be a short jump backward. By following the red line, we can see exactly where this jump leads to. Let's introduce the EBB4 instruction into our exploit so that we can move the execution to the beginning of the A buffer. Before we launch the exploit, let's follow the newly written instruction to see how it works. Use the step into functionality to see how the execution flow is being transferred to the very beginning of the A buffer. EIP points exactly to the first letter A. Let's restart the software so that we are able to run the exploit again. We see that the desired breakpoint at jump was hit. Let's step in and see how the instructions can be followed from the jump to the A buffer. The first part of our exploit is ready. We have successfully altered the execution flow to the A buffer, where we will place the socket reuse shellcode. Now it's time to develop this shellcode. And this concludes part one of the socket reuse video series. Thanks for watching.